room, you know. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm really happy to invite, to welcome back Eva Hansen to talk to you. Um, and I've told, everybody knows about you because, <laughs> because in the, in the DV410, the, the, the dissertation preparation, mm -hmm. I think your thesis was circulated to yeah. people as an example of a winning, you know, um, a dis distinction dissertation that then got published. You know? So that doesn't happen too often. So I think everybody's um, looking to you as a role model. <laughs> but, you know, Eva studied with us um, during one of the pandemic years, which was really quite tough. So you came, you were in person, but socially distanced during the autumn term, what we now, we now call it the autumn term, mm -hmm. not the Michaelmas term. Please come over this side. Cause, um, and, and then we were hoping to be fully in person in January, but instead we were fully online by then. Yeah. So she studied and did her dissertation under rather difficult circumstances. I remember long conversations and office hours online mm -hmm. about farmers and herders and Molly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So, so, so that was a special experience. And then after the, the, the master's program, uh, Ava went on to work with the Overseas Development Institute, where she's working now. So she's a more recent alumnus than the other two people that we've invited in this series this term. So, so I mean, I was together with Ava for a presentation of her work at the European Commission about, I don't know, a month ago? Or yeah, in January. In January, yeah. Uh, invited by a, another former um, MSc Development Studies student who, who works at the commission. And so that, that, that was, her work was extremely well received there where it was not only people in Brussels, but also I guess on the line we had the delegation, the delegation that's sitting in, in Mali, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's sitting in Mali. So yeah, so really good and uh, probably preparing for bigger and better things in the future, yeah? <laughs> okay, I'll leave it to you. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm going to present to you the, what I wrote about in my article and afterwards if you have questions about the article itself or like the d dissertation writing or anything that's linked, more or less shoot. Um, so, Mali has been stuck in an ongoing conflict since 2012 when a rebellion occurred against the then president Amadou Toumani Touré and this was led by Touareg independentists. Soon after, um, soldiers were dissatisfied with the management of the rebellion overthrew the president in a coup d'etat. And then a coalition of jihadist militants opportunistically benefiting from this Tuareg rebellion um, and the political vacuum took control of the country's north. And by the summer of 2012, this jihadist coalition was in control of most of the northern and the central territories. So this conflict has often been framed as a result of global jihad coming to the Sahel. But it has been shown that it's mostly Fulani pastoralists who join these jihadist movements. And so understanding why these Fulani pastoralists have been joining these jihadist movements really is uh, super important in understanding the general conflict, but also how to address uh, the conflict and how to engage with it. And this hasn't really been done enough. And I think it's mostly linked to the fact that when looking at civil wars um, in academia or in research in general, there's a, in macro analysis, there's a big disjunction between dynamics at the bottom and the dynamics at the top. So actions on the ground are often disregarded 
as considered to be locally, like local and private conflicts, uh, rather than being the wars driving cleavage. And this comes also from the fragmentation of social sciences, where you will have anthropology looking at like the grassroots dynamics, whereas like political science might look more at the institutional level. And this is, in my opinion, where one of the main blind spots about the conflict in Mali comes from. So you really have a need to understand the dynamics at the bottom, but also understanding the interaction between these dynamics at the bottom and at the top. And this is why for my research, I aim to merge different scales of analysis. Um, so in order to do that, I first tried to look at the dynamics at the bottom and more specifically, pastoralist and land regimes. And one of the main findings, um, one of the main findings of my research is that malfunctioning land institutions were really a huge factor in explaining uh, the situation in Mali. So traditionally, the institutions regulating pastoralists' access to land and use of land were codified were not codified in rigid rules and boundaries, but they were continuously shaped by ecological factors. And to explain this a bit more, I will look at the case of the Messina floodplains. So the Messina zone is of critical importance because it's both a hotspot of farmer herder conflicts as it's a key transhumance area in the region and it's also a hotspot of jihadist activity. So as we see here, the Messina floodplains are situated in the, in the Niger Delta, and it hosts rice farming, fishing, and livestock rearing activities from various ethnic groups. So herds will tend to converge at the end of the rainy season in the floodplains and remain until, um, and remain in the area for seven to eight months until the next rainy season. So the land regime in the Delta was established by the invading Ardobe, who were Fulani warriors in the 14th century. And they divided the area in 32 territories, which were managed and still are, uh, by the Joros, who were customary chiefs introduced by the Ardobe from the Fulani aristocracy. And in each territory, the Ardobe provided floodplains to their slaves for farming. So in pre-colonial times, land rights were based on social identity and exploitation of resources depended on the social hierarchy. Um, and what's crazy is that the agro-pastoral system of the Messina floodplains has remained the same since the 19th century. Um, and it's been extensively celebrated for its flexibility, especially in light of um, increasing environmental variability because of climate change. It's considered often as a model of indigenous common property management system. And as in theory, it revolves around a close social group uh, controlling access to a ge geographically and physically defined resource for a cl clear set of rules and regulations. Um, but the issue with this perspective is that it completely overlooks that the success of such an institutional structure really depends crucially on the functioning of a cohesive political system. And since the 19th century, there have been many changes that have occurred in the socio-political economic landscape, which have significantly disrupted the institutional functioning of this, um, of this system. So there's quite a few changes, because we're talking since the 19th century. I'm not going to go into all of these changes, but just um, as examples, um, for example, so during colonization by the French, 
massive changes occurred which completely destabilized the system. So for example, land that was used only on a seasonal basis was included in the definition of vacant land, whereas land that was used for agricultural purposes stayed under customary regulations. So that's a very clear example whereby pastoralist land rights was, were completely undermined compared to farmers' land rights. Um, another example, so at Mali's independence, Modibo Keita, who was the president at the time, he had these big developmentalist ideas of agricultural modernization, which were very in trend at the time. And pastoralism didn't really match with these ideas of modernization. So herders were pushed to convert to farming and many pastures were lost to rice fields in big developmental um, projects. So there are many other examples of such changes that have disrupted um, the socioeconomic um, landscape. But the issue is that none of the institutions around land governance have changed in light of these, uh, of these changes. And this has led to increasing resource conflicts between farmers and herders. And these, and these resource conflicts were not really in the moment reactions to resource scarcity, but it was more the result of ongoing political struggle to access and control of resources. Um, Another major moment which is very important to look at is decentralization. Um, because it completely disrupted land governance, uh, again, and worsened pastoralist marginalization. So, in 1992, Mali launched its decentralization program with the introduction of its new constitution. And this marked the beginning of Malian democracy. The decentralization program was in line with an international push uh, from um, international donors in the redefinition of the role of the state and um, looking specifically at the rural areas. Um, this was characterized in Mali by what they call the gestion de terroir approach. And this was local, basically local land management approach to natural resource management. And this new approach to resource management was aimed to cure the bad consequences of post-independence developmentalist ideas by creating local governance structures and harnessing rural people's skills and knowledge. But what it actually did, um, decentralization became a way to develop and enhance patronage systems, and it really increased local or like strengthened local power dynamics and rent seeking and elite capture. So, um, for example, in the Messina floodplains, the newly elected chef du conseil communal. Uh, continued their rent seeking activities that previous administrators already like. So, you had already these activities going on, but they started again, but in a more efficient manner, as they had both more knowledge of the area and more power than their predecessors because of the change in the governance structure. So, Decentralization really did not empower local citizens, but rather really strengthened local elites and government authorities, which really was to the detriment of rural communities and especially pastoralists. So now we can start looking at the link between pastoralism and jihadism. And one really understand so. First of all, much of the attention paid to jihadism in the Sahel looks at Tuareg, um, at Tuareg groups and Tuareg movements. But actually, it has been shown that it's mostly Fulani pastoralists who join these jihadist groups, and especially nomadic Fulani pastoralists. 
And that's really key to keep in mind because the grievances between Tuaregs and Fulanis are very different. Tuaregs were after territorial in the, in, in the independence, independence, whereas Fulanis, their grievances wrote more around land governance, land rights, and farmer herder conflicts. And so this is really key because then we understand that jihadist violence in central Mali is very local and is fueled by anxieties linked to access and control to natural resources and local grievances towards the state. So, for example, the Katiba Messina, which is one of the main jihadist groups in Mali, the name comes directly from the Messina floodplains. And Amadou Koufa, who was the founder of the Katiba Messina and the head of it, really favoured ordinary herders over customary elites. And he really, he, his discourse was all about overthrowing and promising to overthrow these customary chiefs who are considered to, considered to be accomplices of the corrupt state system. So here this quote really reflects um, this uh, narrative whereby um, yeah, like our fight is not directed against the peaceful populations who are victims of bad governance and but yeah, the, these agents are condemned by local populations because they're recognized predators. So we really see how um, these jihadist groups and leaders have been instrumentalizing people's uh, pastoralist grievances uh, for their own benefit. Um, and so also jihadism, when looking back towards decentralization, Jihadism was a way to widen the political scope of conflict for pastoralists because through decentralization, the state actually delimited the political scope of conflict and land related issues to a very local level. And so jihadism kind of provided them the opportunity for herders to realize these grievances in a wider conflict. Um, Jihadist groups also offered an alternative governance system for these populations that had become marginalized. And this is, for example, exemplified through the fact that in November 2016, jihadist leaders told Joros, so like these customary chiefs, not to collect any taxes. And state agents were absent from the region because of obvious security reasons. But basically, by doing this, they banned taxation for access to pastures, which were considered to belong to God. And this example, um, there are many more, really shows how jihadist groups kind of created competing models of stateness. Um, so, in a way, in an ironic way, jihadist groups have really made good use of bad governance, and they have been offering an alternative governance system more appealing to pastoralist interests. Um, and as we were saying before, they also enabled and offered an opportunity for herders to rescale the political scope of conflict which was restricted to lo the local level because of the institutional structure. So all of these different um, facts really highlights that approaching the Malian crisis only through a military approach, through military responses, will not be enough to end the civil war, especially considering pastoralist resentment towards the army. And it is by identifying the sources of legitimacy of jihadist groups within pastoral communities and the dynamics between both parties, this is crucial to really understand how these armed groups might be defeated. Um, the findings point to the urgent need 
for the central government to integrate agro-pastoral concerns into the national agenda and to reinvest in rural areas which obviously will be and is quite challenging considering again the security situation and this has to this also has to be accompanied by a consideration for local political dynamics um, and really to avoid obscuring problematic practices that or patterns of exclusion that had been shadowed um, in the past so the marginalization of pastoralists uh, within land regimes really has to be addressed as well as these long-standing um, institutional issues Thanks. A year from now for that participation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So I think we can open it up. It's this it's, it's filled up, so there's quite a few. Do you want help, Joan? Um sure. Um, do you have any questions? So questions, questions. Okay. Yeah, okay. But Speak up though, so, and then we could repeat the question for the recording. Okay, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to find out what type of literature review you used and why. Okay. Um, so, I, so it was mostly academic. So the question was about what kind of um, literature I used. Yeah, was it like systematic or narrative or? Um, so I remember, sorry, just going back a couple of years. Um, so if I'm being honest, the terminology of the, the different methodology kind of escapes me. But I looked at, so very, it's kind of obvious, it was a desk review um, dissertation, a desk-based dissertation. I looked at secondary literature, mostly um, academic literature, some reports as well to kind of inform some like more factual um, aspects. Um, I don't think it was a systematic uh, literature review in that sense, <laughs> but it was, I think, going into one area of research or one discipline and then kind of new themes kind of led me to new er both to new disciplines but also different so sorry i'm not being very um clear i think also something that i tried doing as i was explaining at the beginning was merging different scales of analysis so i looked at a lot of ethnographies to have more of a kind of understanding of local dynamics but and then I kind of merged it with more political sciences <laughs> articles that would look at the conflict from a kind of top down uh, approach and then and then also with a, I had a lot of theoretical um, literature that fed into it and that literature didn't necessarily uh, like have to do with Mali at the beginning but then it really applied because it was about I don't know like land rights or uh, decentralization so all of these things so I think it was it was very kind of a really really wide range of literature and yeah is that helpful? Can, can I yes, uh, follow please. up on that? Um, so how can you remember, how did you come about to, to have this the theoretical prism that you ended up using? Because, you know, the student, if you remember, cast your mind way back then. Yeah. <laughs> Not that long ago. Uh, they're in the process of doing their, their um, well, topic approval they've already had, and they have to prepare their proposals, and people are demanding of them, so 
you know, what theoretical ideas are you drawing on? Uh, what perspectives are you drawing on? So maybe you could just say a little bit about sure. how you worked your way sure. towards this. Because it's interesting in your paper, the theory in the end mm -hmm. is quite interesting, this top down and bottom up um, perspective. So I think that some of the theory that fed into it came from the different courses I was taking. So I remember taking um, African political economy. And so I remember that, like I talk about Catherine Boone's work at some point um, in, my, in my dissertation. And that came directly from the fact that I was studying her course. But then I think looking at different um, approaches to the conflict and looking at their theoretical, at their theoretical uh, framing and understanding the limitations that um, an article had and how it was tied to their theoretical framework. And then, and then this led me to the, uh, so the kind of approach I choose at the end is political ecology and I think I reached that point because I realized it was a kind of a, a way to integrate these different um, scales, scales yeah. of analysis. Um, but I think it happened very gradually through reading a lot of different literatures from different disciplines and I don't know, when I arrived at that point, I realized that that kind of bridged quite nicely the issues or like the, the gaps I was finding in the rest of the literature, um, if that makes sense. Or like that, that was the theoretical framework that helped me to reconcile these different kind of um, bits of literature that weren't put together usually, if that makes sense. Some more questions. How much did you know about Mali before you started? Um, so when, before my masters, I had done a couple of internships and some of them were um, about the Sahel. It was like research projects in the Sahel. So I remember like learning about, um, learning about Mali then. I had also worked in another NGO that looked at farmer herd a conflict specifically, not in Mali, but I think you have very similar um, dynamics around farmer herd conflicts. Obviously, they're very locally specific because each country's policies and history will impact these and shape these conflicts in different ways. But some of the, they're like, let's say there are patterns that are uh, similar throughout the Sahel region. So I think these different experiences fed into it. And I think also being, I think my, at first I was kind of intrigued by Mali because of the French colonial past and looking at the French military intervention. So I think when I was thinking about my dissertation at the beginning, I was like, oh my God, I can write something very like, like integrating a lot of po like decolonial literature about the French intervention in Mali. And then I kind of got down that rabbit hole about farmer how the conflicts. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, that one idea at first and then you end up writing about something else. Because I remember when so, you started, you wanted to evaluate aid, military aid and the foreign donor community. Yeah. Vis-a-vis -vis Mali, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, Thank you. Just uh, on your um, topic again, how do, is there anything, or did you find anything on how the specific um, local jihadist group is financed? Because uh, in DRC, it's control over natural resources, or diamond fields, for example. Uh, and and I, I feel like that this region is just, it's just agricultural output, isn't it? So is, is there foreign financing as a means to controlling the territory, or what is driving Mm. I mean, they're, they're, they're using farmer herd conflicts as a, as, you know, um, we're here because we want to instate, uh, instate good governance, I guess you can say it like this, but I mean, this is maybe not their, yeah. their real intention. No, so I think you're right, like, this is more like their recruitment strategy in a way, so the, the link with farmer herd conflicts and pastoralism. 
But in terms of financing, I think you have a lot of different, and I'm not an expert, but from what I know, so you do have some gold mines in money and you do have control um, over that. But also because it's seen as, so I think one of the interesting things about money, it's talked a lot as a non-governance space or like a space of um, failed governance. So as if it's a space where there's no governance. I mean, as we see, there are governance structures, maybe just not the ones people want to see. But basically, you also have huge um, routes of illegal trade that go through these uh, places of no governance that then become um, that these groups like whether it's uh, arms trades or different goods that are being traded. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So that's one income. And then I think so you also have the post Qaddafi Tuaregs who came back after the fall of Qaddafi. And that was also, I think, uh, some kind of um, a flux. Um, but maybe more of a human resources more than a with financial arms, with, arms, with arms, arms, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, we're starting to get quite a few questions here. First, Marnia, then Mark. Uh, I'm just curious about the like research itself because there these issues are very much recurring across like many countries in West Central Africa. So I was recently reading about something similar happening on the border between Sudan and South Sudan. So I'm just curious whether you came across of good policy decisions where like land rights ensured that like the interests of farmers and herders were sufficiently addressed. Or whether you see how the uh, state of Mali could implement the land rights differently so this conflict would not have like the substance? Um, so you do have like initiatives. Uh, for example, there's something called local conventions um, where it's a way to enter, because something I didn't speak about in this specific uh, presentation. Uh, in a matter of time, is the issue of institutional multiplicity, multiplicity as well. So you have um, these customary rights and institutions, and then through these different big policy trend moments, you have new layers of institutions and of rights and legal kind of frameworks, which compete. And so then people who are so pastoralists or herder farmers in this context basically end up doing this thing that's called like farm shopping. So you basically kind of pick and choose what rules or regulations f suit you the best at a specific moment in a specific conflict. Like how basically how do you play the system to your advantage? Advantage. And so local conventions are a way to kind of reconcile and re like nest different regulations in one cohesive um, in one cohesive system and I think I mean it's in the name it's very local so I think it also like a lot of these successful approaches have tended to happen on a local level because different regulations um, because of this multiplicity multiplicity as well it's like the only way for them to be integrated properly and for the benefit of the communities it happens often through dialogue and like communal decision making that then result in these um, local conventions and a lot of these also happen through the kind of intervention of NGOs so it's also interesting to look at what kind of actors are involved in recreating or in shaping these um these these systems um, i'm not very familiar with a lot of like the country so i can say is one country stronger from a national perspective in like reshaping rural areas like m institutional multiplicity multiplicity but that would be super interesting to look at as well like in which countries it's more of an international um, aid kind of push in what countries it's more of a 
national level government or maybe more at sub sub national levels that these pushes happen but i think one of the things that came out of your work was you know, recognizing that there was some kind of a fairy tale story yeah at the level of the world bank for instance that almost you know rivals the yeah. ferguson's account of, yeah you know, lucidu so they, it was a good governance place. So yeah, in the early 2000s, during that whole good governance uh, moment of international development, Mali was really considered as a poster child of, um, of democracy and good governance. And although this might have been true on some levels, looking at the rural, uh, at political dynamics on the rural level, and looking at how decentralization was implemented like in these uh, areas really kind of questions and challenges these narratives of good governance and this also really shows that from like a world bank imf perspective the focus was so narrowly like on the capital city and on the very on a fraction of what governance should be so yeah Perfect. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could just, um, it's a very hypothetical question, but you, in your paper you mentioned that uh, local judges, police, officers, etc. don't want to sort of like resolve the conflict because they get rent from both groups trying to pay them off to, so yeah. they want to like keep the, con the conflict going. Mm -hmm. And at the same time you say that um, all these uh, pastoral groups joining uh, jihad, etc., do so to try to like uh, widen the political scope of the conflict. Mm -hmm. So I guess to like make people aware of the struggles, so that mm -hmm. to call attention to them. Um, but have you seen recently maybe a change in the areas around the conflict? Maybe uh, in that sense, because as you said, since jihad sort of like replaces already the like the models of stateness, then surely for these police officers and these judges, uh, now they would not like bring money from like mm -hmm. keeping the, the conflict afloat. Yes. And maybe they see like this sort of like threat coming from jihad. Do you know if it's like an incentive to change behavior? So I mean, this is definitely like the the dynamic that happened whereby. Um, because in so conflicts before before jihadist groups came and kind of started instrumentalizing these grievances what happened was because um of these problematic kind of power dynamics conflicts were never really resolved because you always had someone who could like play a different card kind of and that's like that ties back to um institutional multiplicity whereby there's not one like one clear kind of structure and so um so when jihadism arrived they kind of imposed like one system or one way but then we're talking like very locally specific places so like one like not everywhere they will have had the same impact it's more like a pattern but I'm not really sure uh, how to answer your question about how this will have spread since then because I haven't engaged so much of the data um, recently, I mean. But I, when the article, when I, my dissertation was published into an article a few months ago, I was encouraged to like add some uh, images or like graphs or whatever. And so I found this really interesting, um, I think it's from the OECD, um, where they publish, where you have like maps from various sub -Sahar um, Saharan countries, including Mali, where you see both the intensity evolving, the intensity of conflict evolving throughout time, but also the spreads. And so it's interesting to compare how, you know, like these uh, jihadist movements have um, like the kind of dynamic does it in does it evoke just an intensity but does it also spread and this links to recruitment and kind of this this ties into like governance how successful they are to kind of sell their model I guess or to impose it because it's not always that yeah
It really also signals the importance of this territoriality of the state. You know, how far does this state actually reach mm -hmm. into the territory of a place? Um, Pierre. Um, yeah, I just have a question because um, actually one big part of the story, if I understand well, uh, is that feeling and actually like that's the reality as well uh, that some populations are being marginalized whether it is economically socially even in terms of culture sometimes you have like it works for example in the north that feels yeah. not represented by the central government so um, uh, i was very surprised uh, to discover right now that decentralization instead of being efficient in treating those aspects made like it actually works worsened the situation so i'm just a bit curious if uh, so as you said, you think military, uh, a military, a military conquest and advances is will not like it will not solve the whole problem uh, um, uh, in terms of like deep roots and things like this. So do you think uh, politics of decentralization can be a big part of uh, a new uh, a new attempt to find political solutions, or do you think it would be more part of a problem considering it failed in the past? Um, so maybe just repeat. Yes, yeah, so the question uh, was whether whether decentralization could still be successful at answering um, the issues uh, because of a military approach would not be, or whether it would fail because it has failed in the past. I think it's a super interesting question because um, very often we look at something as if it, and whether it has failed or succeeded, um, just in terms of kind of like the technical like decentralization as a concept and not really understanding of how it has been implemented politically speaking and under what kind of political system and what were the political wins at the time that enabled or prevented um, these processes from happening properly also from an international perspective i mean inter international aid um, decentralization was very focused on the delivery of services and um, not, didn't really look at the political reality of what decentralization meant. So when OECD and all of them they were evaluating decentralization processes, they were all clapping because they weren't looking at how our governance structures actually implemented. They were just looking at policy de like deliverable, so very in very technocratic terms. And so I think that, you know, we were talking about local conventions earlier. The answer to a lot of these questions, in my opinion, has to happen at least a lot, if not, I mean, obviously you mm -hmm. need a top down, but a lot has to happen bottom up. And this could happen through decentralization. But it has to be a decentralization approach that is very politically informed and not blind to political processes, like really taking into account who the actors are, what are the different agendas, and you know, how do you integrate all of these things for there not to be like everyone kind of being able to play their card in a way that's marginalizing always the same communities, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is there a question back there? Did you have a question? No? <laughs> you look very thoughtful. So pensive side that maybe in class I used to sometimes call and you, you had to come in. Maybe could you talk about your job now? Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing? How do you think what does it make you happy? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to. You can also reserve certain answers for for the drink at the pub if you sure. want. But go ahead. Um, so after my masters, I first uh, I first had a job as a program coordinator at a consultancy called Internet um, Tech International Development Europe. They were called Coffee before, if ever that's so. And it was a. Uh, it was basically managing UK aid programs. Um, so it was basically UK like FCDO programs that were contracted to consultancies for them to basically manage them and implement them for the UK government. So I was like on the program management side of that. And now I'm- A particular region? 
Um, no, but in the Department of Governance, Security and Justice. So hoping to still be kind of tied to issues, like to still be looking at issues of conflict and um, fragility and stuff like that. Um, and then now I, so I changed approximately six months, of, no, a bit more, um, last summer, and I'm working as a program officer at ODI. Um, so now it's more research projects because it's a think tank. Um, one of the programs I work on actually is the, the fellowship scheme, so it's a bit different. But um, it's management again. So um, the research projects are really interesting in terms of what is being produced. Uh, they have a very wide range of different topics. I'm in the global risks and resilience team. So a lot of the projects, I mean, it's a super broad research area, but one um, aspect of it looks at conflict and climate change. So that I'm super interested in. The only issue is that I'm on the program management side of things. So it's very admin heavy. Um, and it's basically like looking at contracts and budgets and how things are being, you know, spent and are you doing things in the right in a contract compliant way for your donor blah 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 so am i enjoying it i'm learning uh do i want to be more intellectually stimulated yes how do i make that next move i'm not sure yet <laughs> so it's still work in progress but i think it's kind of hard like the um, entry level positions in international development are kind of tricky because there's not that many and a lot of them are on that kind of program management side and the kind of admin heavy side of things. So um, it's kind of trying to understand how do you make sure if that's not what you're interested in because it's also fine to be interested in program management but to not get cornered and being stuck in that area. So, yeah, that's my next challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you think ODI should um, organize a presentation of this work for you? I mean, that might raise some more interest in different parts of the organization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They want to hold on, though, to their very competent admin exactly. skills. Exactly. What can I? Okay. That's the problem. <laughs> Other questions? Either back on the s substance of the presentation or on the way the research was carried out. Manya. Just last question regarding your dissertation. When did you start like really working on your dissertation? You came up with the question and you started dedicating like 100% of your time to like building up the actual thesis. Um, so I started quite early, but I did like I don't think I was 100% of my time at any like like I started early, which kind of helped me keep it like not too intense um and because it was death space i was just reading a lot so i think when you're like just going through a ton of literature it's doable to do that gradually throughout the you know few months so i think i mean i can't really remember to be honest like whether it was like jan or march or april um but I know that I I knew what my topic was and my approach was around um, like revision time, but I also have friends who have great results and who weren't on the same schedule as me, so it shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. So Sorry. you said when did you know your topic? Sorry. You said around when did you know your, that that's the topic you wanted. So I think I was quite set, like by, so I started, oh my God, I feel like whatever I'm going to say is yeah. <laughs> But I think around revisions, I had a strong sense of what, like what I was writing about. But in terms of the topic on Mulligan and, and, and the 
the conflict in Norway. That, that was quite a bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, more like the approach and yeah. the literature I was looking at and the theory and stuff like that. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, you talked about how you use different disciplines, right? Yes. Um, how do you then integrate different disciplines without drowning too much in those disciplines and kind of neglecting the international development aspect of it? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. I guess um, how do you, mm, can you repeat the question? Uh, okay. So if you think, let me, tell me if I'm wrong, let me rephrase your question. So. You came anyway by the by the time that you were really kind of advancing mm -hmm. and understanding what you were doing, quite explicitly be drawing on uh, uh, political ethnography, and you had you know looked at the conflict literature and the sort of politics mm -hmm. literature be before that, and so I think you're asking how do you reconcile these different approaches? Yeah. Uh, because they are perhaps looking for quite different types of information, types of, um, you know, data points that are meaningful, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, really it's tricky. I think that. looking at the, um, like having case studies where you were like kind of vignettes where you, I was able to talk about specific things that happened and to give examples um so that on the like let's say on that side of the of the spectrum i so sorry you you also asked how do you not drown in like one of the disciplines so that was a bit tricky for example with all of the ethnographic material because i was like oh my god this is such a good example of this and da -da 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 -da. And then at the end of it, I just had to like sacrifice half of like the examples I was bringing in because it still had to be kind of, uh, I still had to have my like kind of political, um, political science theory that would still be there and not completely drowned by my examples. So I think my approach to like writing and um, essays and dissertations, I think it's putting everything together and then going back and taking out. Um, I kind of struggle having like a perfect plan and then it's almost done when it's written. I really have to like bring in everything I think might be useful and then and then kind of like taking out and then making sure that the points I'm making like are kind of balanced. Um, I also think that I most of my kind of theory so was was really clearly outlined in my literature review. So then I didn't have to go into big tangents in my like more substantive uh, chapters about what this theory is, where it came from and contextualizing it, if that makes sense. It was more about applying and kind of like making these connections, um, I think. Yeah, and really importantly, what you did as all good dissertation, you know, master's dissertations would do, is that the theory that remained, the theoretical discussion that remained in your thesis, you used. I mean, mm. it gave you your framework of analysis, et cetera. Because sometimes there's a tendency to have this elaborate discussion of theory, and then you leave it aside and become very descriptive. So some of the weaker dissertations end up like that. But this was quite good because it, it drew on, mm. it honed down what you were saying theoretically, and then, yeah. you know, applied it. In, in so applied I think like all of these concepts of like cost, um, institutional multiplicity and uh, cost, customary law and all of this, I really, I really like explained and explored in my literature review. And then I was looking at examples and why, why then is there a problem with like pastoralists when they have access to several Da, da, da. and why then jihadism coming in is how do they implement a new system of governance because of this institutional multiplicity but I didn't have to talk about the debates of what is institutional multiplicity in these chapters because that was already kind of established in my literature review 
also talking about my approach that was like political ecology or that, yeah, that kind of theoretical framework that I, I kind of looked at in my literature review and I kind of justified my choice then and then I could kind of use it throughout. Um, yeah. So basically with the theoretical framework you describe it or you analyze the theoretical framework, justify why it's important for your research, for your paper, and then later on apply. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. There was a, I saw another hand. Oh, is there somebody else? Did you have another? Uh, I wanted to ask, how did you end up having your paper published? Um, so I think after, when I submitted or after, James recommended that I try and submit it. And it was a really long process because I submitted it to the Journal of uh, Peasant Studies, was finally published. Um, and, and then like two days, or no, maybe not, like a week and a half later, they're like, oh, can you send a PDF or like a different version, like a different format of the documents? So in my head, I'm like, yes, this is such a good sign when it was probably actually just that the platform didn't support what I had submitted. Um, <laughs> and then I didn't hear back for like a year. I mean, I kind of like followed up, but it never led to anything. And so I didn't hear back for a year. And in my head, I was like, okay, that's it. I tried, I failed. Um, <laughs> and then, and then they go back to me a year later, being like, oh, there's a glitch on the system. We just realized it hasn't been attributed to reviewers yet. Are you still okay for us to, to give it to reviews to review? And so, yeah, I, they reviewed it. They came back. I had to do like a few like minor, how do you call it? Like a few edits. Um, minor corrections. That's it. it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then it was out. <laughs> okay. They essentially lost your paper, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, in that yeah. system. Yeah, because once they rediscovered it, it went quite quickly. And they yeah. do do a rigorous referee. So yeah. They would need to read that before it would be agreed to be published. But it was very weird because there's such a gap, a time gap between both. Like, literally, I was looking at my dissertation I had written two years before. And when they gave me the feedback and the corrections I had to make, it's like, where do I find the information that was there? Who did I reference there? It was really tricky, but it's, yeah. But you did it. You managed. Uh, any other? Any other questions? Either about the topic or about um, you know this whole thing about understanding that the discourses in which we might be talking about a conflict may be sharply divergent from what's really driving things. Mm -hmm. so, so for instance, in, 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 in the research on uh, the conflicts in Mindanao and the Philippines, you know, what um, the researchers discovered who really started this long-term, you know, in-depth process of conflict monitoring, mm -hmm. collecting data, and so on, was that uh, a, a lot of the conflict that was pitched in terms of Islam versus Christianity, or even, you know, the political program uh, of independence or autonomy, uh, a lot of the conflict itself was driven by Rido or clan feuds. Mm -hmm. A lot of the violence was tied up in this. And, you know, I think in many conflict situations, it's really important to look into that because what is driving very often the violence, and especially the most exacerbated violence, was retribution for, you know, between mm -hmm. clans, between families, mm -hmm. all housed within the political, the articulated political movements. Yeah. So, and I think you found a certain amount of that going. Yeah, on. I mean, a hundred percent, because I think when you look at these conflicts from a Western perspective, what's portrayed in the media, etc. It's basically Al-Qaeda, ISIS that's spreading. But ultimately, Islam has so little to do in terms of the motivations of the people joining these groups. 
um, you really realize that it's like this kind of um, uh, material grievances and materialistic op opportunism of people who've been marginalized, who kind of all of a sudden have a new way of potentially being in a better spot. Um, yeah. Okay. Eva, it was really great that you found the time to come back here and yes, talk to the students who are right now facing the same challenges you were facing uh, when you were. And, but at least they're here in person with us now and not having to do it through Zoom, which was what Eva had to do. So I think everybody would like to thank you. Yeah?